Hello, everyone. Uh, we're going to get started. Our next speaker is uh, Sebastian Tsong from Princeton. Um, he's been working in the area of connectomics, and he's going to be giving one of the, uh, one of the plenary talks for today. Uh, we're very glad to have him. And actually, I saw one of his presentations probably about three or four years ago. There was a workshop that uh, Los Alamos had uh, put together uh, up in Santa Fe. And, and again, from, from then on, the, the work. Time flies. I think it was maybe eight years ago. Uh, maybe. Years ago. Yeah, I'll have to go back and look. <laughs> but again, we're, we're very glad to have Sebastian here with us. And, and with that, uh, go, go ahead. Thank you. Well, thanks to Murata Jacob for inviting me. I'd like to first address a question that was asked by a gentleman earlier today after the panel, which was, why do we need to record the activity of many neurons at the same time? Why is it not enough to record from a single neuron? And indeed, here's a famous experiment um, uh, from Itzhak Fried and Christoph Koch uh, from a single neuron recording in a human patient. How many of you guys have seen this? Most of you, have, well, at least half of you have seen this. So you can see the stimuli uh, that were shown to the human patient, and below you can see the spike trains that were recorded. Um, and so you can see that this neuron responded to pictures of Jennifer Aniston. It didn't respond to other celebrities like Kobe Bryant or, or uh, Julia Roberts or to the Eiffel Tower or to spiders and so on. So they call this uh, the Julia Rob uh, sorry, the Jennifer Aniston neuron. Um, it doesn't really prove that this neuron responds only to Jennifer Aniston because the, the, the ensemble of stimuli was not large enough. But what you can say is that this is a very selective neuron. All right. But this is what you're able to do with single neuron recordings. You can describe the fact that this neuron responds to Jennifer Aniston, but how, you know, explaining how this neuron comes to be selected for Jennifer Aniston, that is what neuroscience has so far failed to do. We have a lot of theories. Some of them are embodied in convolutional nets and so on used by machine learning people. But neuroscientists have not been able to explain. Now, this is really the big challenge. Can we explain? And indeed, if we could explain, then we would provide something that is useful for people who are building uh, neurocomputing devices. And to do that, actually, with two-photon imaging, I think the important thing is not having lots of neurons recorded at the same time. The important advance is the ability to combine different kinds of information about the brain. So in addition to physiology, the activity of, of, of neurons inside some network, if you take two-photon imaging and you take a serial electron microscopy image, a high-resolution electron microscopy image of the same brain tissue, you can align those two images and in principle pull out the connectivity and activity of all the neurons inside that circuit. So it's not the number of neurons that are recorded at the same time. It's the ability to overlay different kinds of information. That's what's important for succeeding in, in the area of explanation. And so this is what modern neuroscience is all about. It's combining physiology, anatomy. And the third tool, of course, is genetics. Um, the geneticists have provided us with ways of manipulating types of neurons. And th therefore, we can do experiments that are not only observation, but if we have hypotheses, we can test them. Uh, uh, through manipulation, which is important for establishing causality. And I would say that the, the convergence of these three techniques is best illustrated in the retina. That's where some uh, success, we can brag about some success. I'm going to review that today. Um, I'm going to talk about my own work, but I'm also going to talk about the work of, of other people uh, because the purpose of this talk is to give more of an overview than just to talk about my own work. And I'll try to distinguish between my work and other people's work as best as I can. Introduction to the retina. Um, the retina, you can think about it as a, a club sandwich. Um, there are three layers of uh, cell bodies, outer nuclear layer, inner nuclear layer, and um, ganglion cell layer. So those are like the bread. And then there's two neural pill layers. These are just branches of neurons. So they're like the meat. And OK, so this is a, 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 a cut through the retina that's perpendicular to the, the, to the plane of the retina. And light comes in through here. It hits the rods and cones. Um, it gets uh, processed by synaptic interactions in the outer plexiform layer, more complicated synaptic interactions in the inner, inner plexiform layer. Um, and then uh, ganglion cells are the outputs. They send their axons to the, to the optic nerve, which goes to the brain. Uh, 
Here's a, a kind of iconic diagram, a cartoon from Dick Maslin trying to illustrate the diversity of retinal neurons. So one thing that neuroscientists have come to terms with, or are coming to terms with, is the diversity of cell types. So you can't just say neuron anymore. You've got to say what type of neuron. Traditionally, in textbooks, they say there's five classes of neurons, photoreceptors, horizontal, bipolar, amacrine, and ganglion cell types. But as you can see, of each of those classes, broad classes of neurons, there's many different types. And this, this cartoon illustrates some of the diversity. So let's focus on the bipolar cells. The bipolar cells, there's about a dozen. Um, their cell bodies are in the outer nuclear layer. And so their dendrites receive inputs from the rods and cones. Um, and they send them, sorry, they, sorry, their cell bodies are in the inner nuclear layer. And their dendrites receive inputs from the rods and cones. And their axons send uh, output to the inner plexiform layer. So they're, they're the only conduit of information from the outer plexiform layer to the inner plexiform layer. And you can see there's about a dozen. That's been known for some time. Um, and recently, with serial block phase scanning electron microscopy, uh, Winfred Denk generated some data sets which were used to make some discoveries. So you can see this is a very high resolution imaging technique. These are cell bodies. And this is the neuropel. This is the inner plexiform layer, which you can't see uh, in light microscopy because these branches are too small. So that's a tangled up spaghetti in there. And from that spaghetti, we can reconstruct any individual neuron inside, that, um, inside this retina in principle. This is the mouse retina. Now, in help, this, this paper, Helmstetter et al., it's primarily due to Moritz Helmstetter. We played a supporting role. Um, but uh, this was a, a work mainly done in Winfred Denk's laboratory. Uh, they proposed an anatomical classification of 12 bipolar cell types. So uh, you can see right here, here's cartoons of these bipolar cell types. There's, um, did I say 12? I guess 11, what's it? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Okay, 11 cone bipolar cell types. Sorry, I got that wrong. One rod, bi rod, bi rod bipolar cell type. And this matched up with earlier work done with light microscopy and genetics, um, except, surprise, even in this very old supposedly solved problem, Helmstetter et al. identified a extra type they called X, the XBC. All right, so um, electron microscopy has the advantage that in principle it's complete, right? You can, um, no, there's no stone left unturned, no cell left unreconstructed, so if you do a census of cell types, you're, you hopefully will, will uh, end up with all of them. Uh, and then recently, <laughs> that's what we said to, to ourselves, but recently we've been doing this even more. And in my lab, we've discovered yet another on bipolar cell type. It turns out that type 5 bipolar cells have to be subdivided into 3, not 2, as previously suspected. So you might say, well, all this, this is just splitting of hairs. How do you know that these are really types? And indeed, Charles Darwin said, those who make many species are the splitters, and those who make few are the lumpers. So maybe we're just splitters, and this is all subjective, and how do you know, you know why should you believe that uh, we've actually identified a new cell type as opposed to just some kind of subjective, uh, uh, maybe it's just some kind of subjective endeavor. Um, it turns out in the retina, a criterion has emerged, which is called the mosaic property. So the idea is, is that if you found a real cell type, um, the axons, um, the axonal arbors of these types um, roughly are spaced quasi-periodically. So in this case, they actually roughly tile the retina. This is one type of bipolar cell, and they roughly tile the retina. And if you don't find, uh, let's say you haven't split far enough, what happens is that you've got two sets of these mosaics, and they're on top of each other, and you see a lot of collisions. And if you split too finely, then what happens is that you get a lot, you get a lot of gaps inside here. So this has emerged as a, at, le at least a provisional criterion for when, you've, um, when, you, when to stop splitting. Now, the next question you might ask is, well, why do we need all these bipolar cell types? You may have heard that bipolar cells are center surround filters. So if, why do we need 12 types of center surround filters? Well, people are beginning to figure that out with two-photon imaging. So Thomas Euler's lab um, has done two-photon imaging, and they've found that the temporal response properties of these bipolar cells are diverse. So here's the response to a drop in full field stimulation, and you can see that uh, some of these off-bipolar cells respond much more rapidly, say about 50 to 100 milliseconds more rapidly than um, these other bipolar cells. 
And there's not only a difference in latency, there's also a difference in the, in the shape here. So this is a, a transient response, and, and this is a sustained response. So once you know there are types of bipolar cells, you can ask the question, how are they functionally different? There's also differences in color, and people are still trying to characterize the differences. So here's a case where neuroanatomy um, is critical because you can't even phrase the question about function if you don't know what these types are. Okay, what can we understand further about the retina using these types? Here's, an, here's, a, ty here's a different class of cell called an amorcon cell. This is, uh, it has no axon. It's, its arbor is purely inside the inner plexiform layer. This is the famous one called the starburst amorcon cell. Um, you can see it's much, it's, it's quite large. Uh, those, uh, uh, well, I'll show you the scale later on, but uh, this is about uh, 300 microns across. Um, and when viewed from the side, it's flat as a pancake. It's about one third of the way through the interplexiform layer. And so we recently, uh, we recently analyzed the bipolar starburst circuit. Here's a bunch of bipolar cells, and here's a bunch of starburst amorcon cells. This is the starburst amorcon cells by themselves. So in this case, there's a mosaic of starburst amorcon cells, but they're highly overlapping. So it's not a tiling, it's not sort of a, uh, a one times coverage, but a many times coverage. So here's a lot of starburst amorcon cells, and here's a bunch of bipolar cells. And then we analyze the, the properties of this connectivity. And to make a long story short, what we found was this. It seems that bipolar cells of type 2 are connected close to the soma of the starburst cell, and bipolar cells of type 3A are connected farther away from the, from the, from the soma of the starburst cell. And just to look at this picture, any given bipolar cell is at all distances from starburst soma, right? Because any given bipolar cell, it's, it's, uh, got, ax, it's got dendrites of starburst amorcon cells, many starburst amorcon cells passing through it, uh, and those starburst somas are different locations from each other. But these bipolar cells show preferences in what they make synapses on. So here is what I call, uh, well, and the other thing, I, just to connect this with what the physiologist told us before, the bipolar cells of type 2 uh, respond more slowly to light than the bipolar cells of type 3A. And so I call this space-time specificity, because here's two locations in space, and because of this time delay, uh, the bipolar cells are sending signals from two uh, different times. Right, so that's space-time specificity. And as you can see, that's totally appropriate for the computation of the direction of motion, because if a stimulus goes from inside to out, it will activate uh, the bipolar, the type 2, BC2 first, and activate BC3A second, but the signals, because of this time delay, will reach the starburst dead right at the same time, and they can sum constructively. On the other hand, if the stimulus moves inward, it activates 3A first and 2 second, the signals will become, uh, will arrive at the starburst dead right even farther apart in time, and they won't sum constructively. So if you have a nonlinearity, then you'll get direction selectivity. You'll get a stronger response to outward motion than to inward motion. And you may be familiar with this. This is basically the Reichardt detector model of motion detection, uh, which was proposed in the late 50s. And indeed, um, I'm reversing the chronological order, but in 2002, it was discovered that starburst amorcon cell dendrites are direction selective. So with two-photon imaging, Thomas Euler, working in Winfred Denk's laboratory, showed that if you move a stimulus from the inside outward, you activate the starburst dendrite. If you move it inward, you don't. Um, and the starburst dendrites all function independently. So you can activate one dendrite without activating the others, and each dendrite has its own preferred direction. So here's a case where you do have, here's a proven case, you know, people always talk about dendritic computation. Here's a proven case where dendrites, many dendrites of one neuron function independently. Uh, and so this anatomical fact may be the explanation of this physiological observation from a dozen years ago. Now, what I'd like to now, just to highlight sort of the general idea here, what I'd, like to, what I'd like to say now is that this structure of the retina makes sense in light of this function. So the structure is in terms of cell types. And remember that these bipolar cells, they have their axonal arbors in different depths inside the interplexiform layer. So the layering of the retina, actually the locations of the cell bodies don't really matter very much for function. It's the locations of the, uh, of the axons and dendrites that matter. Um, and you can see that the axons are in different depths. 
And this, this line right here, this dashed line, is where the starburst American cell dendrites are. Right? That's where they are. And, well, when the starburst American cell was first discovered, we knew that the dendrites were there, but we had no explanation as to why. But here it's obvious, right? If, indeed, the starburst American cell has to be wired to BC2 and BC3A, it can't be down here right, because then it would miss both arbors. It can't be up here because it would miss the 3A arbor. It has to be here. So the layout, the structure is intimately tied uh, with the function inside the retina. The layering does make sense. Just to go on, to give you the historical sequence, in 1964, uh, Barlow first discovered that, Barlow and Levick, Hill and Levick discovered that there were direction-selective ganglion cells in the retina. So the retina does some computations. It's not simply registering luminance, uh, or contrast, but it's actually computing the direction of motion. Um, in 1980, Familietti and Maslin and others discovered the starburst American cell. Nobody knew what it did. Uh, in 2002, Thomas Euler showed that uh, starburst American cell dendrites are direction selective. In 2002 and 2011, evidence was found that starburst dendrites that point opposite to the direction, opposite to the preferred direction of the ganglion cell are wired to this ganglion cell. That makes sense because these synapses are inhibitory. So this supports the, the idea that the ganglion cell simply inherits its direction selectivity from the starburst cell with a minus sign. And in 2013, uh, Bodden et al showed the existence of two, two pathways, one of which is delayed relative to the other from, through the bipolar cells. And in 2014, we showed the existence of space-time wiring specificity. So potentially providing an explanation for the direction selectivity of this ganglion cell, which was discovered 50 years ago. So as you can see, it's a difficult path to actually, you know, people often are surprised to find out that direction selectivity in the retina, we don't know the mechanism. It's kind of embarrassing if you think about it, right? We're making an art, trying to make artificial intelligence and we don't know how the retina computes direction selectivity. That represents, I think, the failure of neuroscience, but on the other hand, the promise of neuroscience that maybe with the tools we have, we can actually figure this out. And I should say that this is very simplistic. This is one pathway, perhaps the shortest pathway through uh, the retina that explains direction selectivity, but this is embedded inside a very complicated connectome. Remember that there's two dozen at least two dozen kinds of American cells that are mediating interactions in the interplexiform layer. And so this is really just a small, small part of the story probably, but at least it's something. Uh, we recently showed that the on and off circuits are analogous, so this is space-time wiring specificity in the off circuit, and now we have uh, space-time wiring specificity in the on circuit. We've got some unpublished data on that. And indeed, uh, something makes sense now too. These bistratified cells, you can see that these are the, these cells which have their dendrites in two different depths inside the retina were discovered by Cajal around 1900. But nobody knew the reason for this structure. Yet another, the problem in that anatomy always is structures without a function, right? But here it's obvious why it has to be that way. If there's two circuits, an off circuit and an on circuit that are providing the um, direction selectivity information for on and off channels, then this on off ganglion cell, which is responds to both light and dark stimuli moving in the same direction, it can combine the on and off channels by having these two dendrites at different depths inside the retina. So the structure, again, uh, you know, may, maybe it was unexplained for uh, almost 100 years. The structure over the last 20 years has become obvious. You know, around the 1980s, people figured out there's a starburst cell right here and there's a starburst cell right here. So there's a reason for this bistratified cell to look like this. Um, and I should say that's only one kind of ganglion cell. There's at least 15 ganglion cell types. Here's a recent paper from my lab um, doing a combined molecular anatomical classification. We collaborated with a geneticist, Josh Sains, and a classical anatomist, Dick Maslin. Um, but here's something exciting. Uh, one of my collaborators, Thomas Euler, um, has a purely physiological or almost purely physiological classification of ganglion cell types. So what they do is they just take a, a retina, 
and they image with two photon imaging thousands of neurons at the same time, and they expose it, these neurons to a battery of visual stimuli. So let's say uh, full field stimulation with a step and a chirp, moving bars, noise, uh, color, and so on. And just by classifying the physiological responses, they think they can, they can uh, visual responses, they can distinguish between at least 30 ganglion cell types. Uh, and many of these, they follow up and they validate. They show that if you, if you take one of these physiological clusters and look at its anatomy, those neurons all have the same appearance. So that gives some confidence that this is actually pulling out real cell types. Uh, but it seems also that some of these are very coarse distinctions, so it could be that there's as many as 50 ganglion cell types in the retina. So this story is still developing. And just to underline uh, the idea here, what is a cell type? A cell type is a population of neurons that share similar molecular, anatomical, and physiological properties. And so, uh, in, in my opinion, you should have a purely molecular definition, a purely anatomical definition, and a purely physiological definition, and you know they're correct if they agree with each other. So that's a cross-validation uh, idea. Um, now, cell types are the major way in which we can relate structure and function because it's very, it's very beautiful, actually. You don't have to do the experiments in the same retina because you can do the physiology experiments in one retina, identify the cell type, and then do the anatomy in another retina, and then because you have this Rosetta Stone of the cell types, you can uh, compare the, the physiology and anatomy. But there's a more direct approach, which is just to do them in the same retina, and that was already done. That's, you know, it's already been demonstrated by Winfred Denk. Um, here is a two-photon image of uh, ganglion cells. Um, and in circles, um, they've circled the ones that are selective for different directions, and you can find the same cell bodies inside the EM image. So you can combine connectivity and activity in exactly the same retina without going through the cell types uh, um, intermediary. Uh, and I should say that uh, we are supposed to produce the functional connectome with Thomas Weather. He's going to, to do, use two-photon imaging to, um, to uh, find the activity or visual responses of 1,000 ganglion cells and then hopefully we will reconstruct the entire retinal connectome. Uh, in the past, we haven't done the full thing. We've only done these sparse wiring diagrams, but we want to do the full thing. And so that's a project that's just started. Okay, so what's after the retina? Well, I, um, of course, am interested in not just the retina. I mean, the retina is a beachhead in the, in the following sense. So people always said connectomics, that's good for flies. That's good for worms. That'll never work for interesting stuff, right? So the retina is uh, the, the, the beachhead of the invasion into the, into the mammalian central nervous system, right? The retina is the first place where it's been shown <laughs> that connectomics can yield some results. Um, and uh, of course, then the response is, that's just the retina. <laughs> so of course, you know, that, the challenge is that we have to move towards uh, the brain, the, what's the brain proper, and uh, the cortex is obviously a big challenge, and I've been thinking about that. And here, um, you know, it's not just perception that we want to address. I think, I think that the challenge here is to go towards the properties of the cortex that are related to human-like intelligence. And what do I mean by that? Um, I would, you know, I can, I can rattle off a bunch of things. They're not original on my part. I've, I've, I've heard them all from other people. Um, one one uh, idea is the processing of items in context, right? Our current systems are good at recognizing single objects, but to really have a sophisticated uh, uh, notion of the relationship between items and their context would obviously uh, uh, make these systems more intelligent. And we want complex, complex abstract relationships. Um, we would like to have uh, the intelligence embedded in a perception action loop. Um, and we want to go beyond um, the sensory tasks or motor tasks to really the home ground of classical AI, right? The home ground, the stronghold of classical AI, whether it's language, reasoning, planning, those, those aspects uh, which neural nets have been harder for neural nets. Uh, and then we would like one-shot learning, declarative memory kind of capabilities. And so, indeed, that's part of the reason uh, why I recently moved to Princeton, because I'm surrounded by people who are studying uh, these kinds of issues um, in, ma in mice. Now, they may seem like a disconnect here. I said human-like intelligence, and then I, I talked about mice. <laughs> so. Um, uh, so I, I need to do a little justification there. Um, so much of what we know about 
these kinds of aspects of human intelligence has come from studies of cognitive neuroscientists, um, human patient studies, neurophysiology in primates, non-human primates, and lesion studies in non-human primates. But recently, the mouse has become, rodents have become established as a, as a model system in which you can study simpler versions of all of these phenomena. Um, so in addition to the occipital cortex of the mouse, which uh, actually has a pretty sophisticated visual system, uh, contrary to popular belief, but a lot of people are studying it. Um, outside V1, there's at least seven retinotopically organized extrastriate visual areas. It's pretty complicated. There's fewer hierarchies. So it's believed there's a hierarchy like the primate visual hierarchy, but it might have just three levels instead of seven levels. Um, there's a posterior parietal cortex. So that wasn't actually known until maybe 10 or 20 years ago, firmly established that there indeed is an analog of primate posterior parietal cortex that you could find in, in mice and rats. There's a prefrontal cortex. Again, some people wrote papers saying there's no rodent prefrontal cortex, or there's no, no equivalent, but in fact there is. And of course, there's a medial temporal lobe, uh, and that recently, uh, you know, studies of that won the Nobel Prize recently. So all these cortical areas are being investigated, and I view this as a kind of playground, right? So here's all these people studying um, neural activity in uh, cognitive, cognitive abilities of mice, and uh, that's just input to my uh, connectomics lab, right? We can try to combine the anatomy with the physiology. Uh, and so we've got Michael Berry, uh, Carlos Brody, and David Tank. Um, and why, why is there all this stuff going on? Well, this dates to an invention um, of I guess David Tank was kind of a pioneer in this. So back in 2007, they realized that in order to study all these cognitive abilities in mice, you can't study anesthetized mice. You have to study awake mice. And it's difficult to image the brains of mice that are moving around, so they decided to fix, head fix the mice, or the, or the rats, and stick them inside virtual reality. So here's, the, here's a, I think they hacked Quake or Doom in the first version. They got a video game engine, and here's this, this rodent running on a trackball and controlling um, a virtual reality uh, system. And because its head is stabilized, um, you, can, you can see um, the activity of individual neurons by two-photon calcium imaging. And this was a, a kind of revolution, I think, because before uh, it was very difficult to get two-photon imaging working, but this, um, you know, the mark of the success of this technique is that everyone's adopting it. Everyone's doing it. Uh, Princeton is especially strong in this because it's where it originated. In fact, you know, all the PIs are, are piggybacking on David's capability for doing this. So we have uh, an incredible array of two-photon imaging uh, going on. And you, know, you can't do this in monkeys yet. Or it's hard, much harder to do this in monkeys. It's happening, but mice is where it's at right now. Maybe monkeys will become a big deal later on, but there's certain advantages to working in mice. Okay, so what do we want to understand? Well, for me, I'm an anatomist. I want to understand what is the function of cortical structure? And this is really a difficult one because we know a lot about cortical anatomy, but much of it has seemed useless to be impolite. So the layers of cortex, the fact that uh, there's all these different cell types, we've known this ad nauseum, but they've been structures without a function, mostly. And that's why many cortical physiologists are hostile towards connectomics. They're hostile towards neuroanatomy because it hasn't helped them in the past. And so, you know, what can I say? We'll try again. We'll try again. And hopefully with better technologies, we'll, we'll be able to assign functions to these structures. We'll first of all have a better, more accurate description, a more accurate and complete description of the structure. And second of all, figure out how it relates to function. So, why should we care? Well, um, well, cell types, right? So cell type classification is going on in the retina. It's been productive for understanding retinal function. I would say that cell type classification in the cortex is highly primitive. I don't know that there's a single class of cell in the cortex that I would consider a pure cell type as opposed to a mixture. So I'll, I'll, I'll come, go out on a limb and say that. I don't know that any pure cell types have really been demonstrated in the cortex. And so we've got to do that. It has to be done. It has to be done by, by applying genetics and really high resolution precise anatomy. And it's important because as I showed you before in the retina, cell types constrain connectivity, right? The arrangement of their dendritic and, and axonal arbors impose constraints 
on what the connect connectivity can be. If they don't overlap, they can't connect. And so the innate architecture of the cortex is encoded in cell types. That's the belief, at least, right? Cell types are thought to be encoded in the genome. Every cell type has a shape of its arbors, and therefore, the genome encodes the innate connectivity of the cortex through cell types. But on top of that, uh, there's plasticity, right? So this, these are just constraints. They don't actually determine connectivity. These are constraints within which plasticity can operate. And so we need very precise information about these, which we can get potentially by, by combining two-photon imaging and uh, serial electron microscopy. So now I'm going to go out and on, on a limb here and talk about, you know, I'm going to act like a junior assistant professor and talk about what I'm going to do in the future as opposed to what I've done before. Um, these things take a long time, so uh, it's actually good for me to talk about what I want to do because to undertake a long, a long project like this, I really have to be committed. So it's helpful to have people's reactions. But I'm interested right now in the posterior parietal cortex. So this is a multimodal association area. What do I mean by that? Well, you can see right here the location of the PPC inside the rat brain. Um, it's surrounded by sensory cortices. So here's the visual areas in the occipital lobe. Here are the parietal areas, somatosensory. And there's auditory areas right here. So convergence of visual, uh, auditory, and somatosensory input onto this multimodal association area. Now, there's a lot of theories about what the posterior parietal cortex does um, based on human and primate studies. One theory is that it's involved in the transition from perception to action. Uh, for example, um, there's a lot of work on coordinate transforms between external reference frames and, and egocentric reference frames. And egocentric reference frames are relevant for your own actions, whereas external reference frames are about the objects in the world that you want to act on. Uh, and so PPC may be all about finding a particular kind of context for items, in particular the actions that that item affords uh, or can stimulate and so on. Those, that, that, that particular kind of action context may be the function of PPC. And you know, as you might expect, uh, in, in this kind of uh, function, uh, the PPC does have roles in attention and working memory. So it's a very interesting area. So here's the kind of task that's uh, being studied. Um, this is a working memory task. This is a paper uh, by Chris Harvey. It came out of David Tank's lab in 2012. Um, a very simple task. It's a T-maze. So the rat has to run through this long arm of the T-maze. At the end, turn left or right and get a reward. And the direction that the rat should turn is instructed by a cue at the beginning of the T-maze. So if it's a left turn, then uh, let's say there's a white visual, a white visual stimulus. And if it's a right turn, there's a green visual stimulus. It's not usually colors, but you can use whatever stimulus you want. It, um, but the key is that there's no stimulus right here. So while, while the rodent is running down this T maze in this part, it has to remember something. Right? The stimulus that cues the left or right turn is gone. So this is a very simple short term or working memory task. And here's what uh, they observed. This is uh, activity. This is a two-photon uh, image uh, from, from PPC. And here's regions of interest one, two, and three. Here's three different cells. And each of these, uh, each of these bars right here is showing one run through the T maze. And the red bars are correct right trials. The blue bars are correct left trials. And you can see that this cell is only activated by the right trials, cell one. And this cell is activated by, um, this cell is activated only by the right trials too. And cell three is only activated by the left trials. All right, so that's interesting because um, you're seeing here that some PPC cells encode a memory of the Q stimulus. The stimulus is no longer there as it's running through the uh, T maze. And if you now, um, if you now arrange uh, the cells that are active on one, on either the right or the left trial, you can find a kind of sequence. Here's the Q offset. Um, the neurons are active at different times during this delay period. And so what this means is that uh, on, on the left trials, there's some particular sequence of neurons, one, two, three, 
4, 5, which are active during the delay period. And on the uh, other trials, then on the red trials, there's some other sequence like this. So an activity sequence, there's two activity sequences that are observed, and the identity of the activity sequence encodes which of the stimulus stimuli that the, the rodent saw in the queue. So this raises then a lot of interesting questions we can address by combining two-photon imaging and connectomics. Some of the science to be done is hypothesis-driven. For example, does connectivity support this sequential activity? And of course, models might predict this, right? So Hebbian plasticity would predict that if the neurons get, if the neurons get activated in a certain sequence, spike time independent plasticity should strengthen the synapses that are sequential. Right? And those sequential synapses then would be more likely to produce that sequence again in the future. So you might expect that there would be two, uh, two groups of neurons. Inside each group of the neurons, you see sequentially organized connectivity. And we can go and, and test that idea. Uh, and if that were true, then it might be good evidence that local connectivity supports sequential activity. Another possibility is that the, connectivity, uh, the sequential activity comes from somewhere else. Maybe there's long-range connections which are supporting this. Maybe there's some signal from um, the medial temporal lobe uh, or from, from uh, the prefrontal cortex, which is helping to drive the sequential activity. So this would require looking at long-range connectivity, not just short-range connectivity. What about the, the cell types? Well, one interesting possibility is that these cells at the beginning of the sequence are in a different layer or a different cell type than the cells at the end of the sequence. Right? If, if the beginning of the sequence is driven by a stimulus and the stimulus kind of information flows in through connections at a particular layer of the cortex, then uh, you might expect the beginning neurons and the end neurons to be in different cell types or different layers. And you can go and test that and that would then perhaps shed light on the functions of cell types. And in general, you could just take your favorite neural simulation, try to train it to produce this task, and see if it matches up uh, uh, with the activity patterns that are observed here. So any kind of model, any kind of model of learning in the cortex, we can constrain it with this kind of experiment. Uh, and then, of course, there's just discovery science. We don't know what's going to come out of this. I mean, in particular, just discovering the cell types through precise analysis is a kind of discovery science that has to be done and will be useful beyond this particular experiment or this particular set of hypotheses. Okay, another kind of, uh, of uh, thing that's going on. So the problem with the short-term memory task is that during this delay period, you don't know, so when the, rat, when the mouse or rat is running through here, you don't know if it is storing a memory of the stimulus or it's storing an intention of a future action. Is it the input to the choice or the output to the choice? And so in order to distinguish between those possibilities, uh, Carlos Brody has been working on the accumulation of evidence kind of, of tasks. And these are, again, um, patterned after uh, uh, similar studies done by Bill Newsom and Mike Shadlin in primates. But it turns out that r mice and rats can do this kind of um, task, too. So here it is. The rat um, fixates, i.e., it has to stick its nose into this port. And then once it does that, um, a sequence of auditory clicks is played on either side of the rat. A Poisson uh, sequence of clicks here and a Poisson sequence of clicks here. And the task of the rat is to, is to uh, then go to the side on which more clicks were heard and receive a reward. So this is called accumulation of evidence because uh, effectively the, the rat has to accumulate evidence over time or in some sense, count the number of clicks, something like counting. And so here, it can't just make a decision in the beginning. It actually has to weigh the two alternatives throughout the, throughout the trial and then, and then make a decision at the end. And a recent paper from Carlos's lab just published in Nature, it's very nice. Uh, it distinguishes between a posterior parietal area and a frontal area. Um, and you can see that uh, in, the, in, the, in the PPC, the neurons have a graded representation of this accumulator variable, but in the frontal area, prefrontal area, there's a more categorical or binary representation of the accumulator variable. Simply what it's sort of what the mouse, you can think of it as what the rat might do 
at that point in time if it had to decide. Right? So it encodes the sign of the accumulator variable. So this suggests that the PPC is important for accumulating the evidence in a graded way, but the FOF, the frontal cortex, is important for generating or selecting the action. Okay, so these are the kinds of uh, questions I would like to um, address, but uh, we have to move beyond our current uh, connectomics capabilities. So connectomics 1.0, I'll describe, right? This is uh, my personal experience, but it's, I think, echoed by other people. Um, from 2006 to 2010, we worked on machine learning for analyzing the images, and we deployed 3D convolutional nets. Uh, back then, everyone thought it was weird how soon, how soon opinion changes. Now it's the standard way of doing the first uh, image analysis. From 2009 to 11, uh, we worked on combining human and machine intelligence because CompNet still made errors. Uh, in 2011 to 2013, we worked on crowdsourcing. So we uh, scaled up to large numbers of humans uh, through iWire, a, a website that recruits volunteers to uh, help map the retinal connectome. In 2013, we collaborated with our friends in Heidelberg to uh, densely reconstruct a cube of IPL that's one-tenth of a millimeter on a side. Um, and I should mention all this stuff was done with, uh, with, in a collaboration with Winfred Deck. We, we got the data from him and so on. And in 2014 was our first real discovery, which was space-time wiring specificity in the retina. So as you can see, it was uh, eight years, and it was extremely painful. Um, iWire is a lot of fun. So here's iWire. You can play, or maybe you can recruit your kids to play. Um, here's an online community. Um, the, you color by collaborating with the CompNet. Every time you, you click, the CompNet colors farther. There's an international leaderboard. You can see that people from many different countries are helping us reconstruct the starburst American cell. And there's a chat room. And uh, just to prove to you that some people find this really fun, uh, here's stuff I heard in iWire chat. Damn, I've been sitting here for four hours now. I'm cold and hungry, but I can't leave it. Um, last night, my mom told me to go to bed, and I was like, but mom, I'm mapping, LOL. Uh, then I kept mapping until 2 in the morning, smiley face. You know, I get a very subversive pleasure out of thinking of little kids disobeying their moms to do neuroscience research. <laughs> well, I'm comfortably enough in the top five, I think I can afford to go take a shower. So it's mildly addictive, but not so much that we interfere with personal hygiene. But seriously, so people were surprised that we could actually get, turn this task into kind of a fun task that people would do without getting paid. Neuroanatomists always thought about this as tedium. Uh, but, uh, but seriously, you know, this, this is kind of fun, but it's a lot of work, uh, work that we're getting out of people. It takes about 40 hours of practice. You know, so, so, so iWire has been really useful for understanding how humans do this task and how they can be educated to do this task because uh, the, the images are very noisy and challenging. It takes at least 40 hours of training before you can produce data that's close to being good enough for scientific results. So uh, we have this problem, how do we train expertise? How do we combine multiple people's opinions to get uh, some crowd wisdom? How do we combine multiple people's opinions to get an accurate results? Uh, how do we incentivize and motivate people so they don't quit? So all these, all these kinds of things we've learned in iWire are important whether or not you have volunteers or paid workers. Okay, but you know, obviously for Connectomics 2.0, we can't, we can't just solve this purely by having humans uh, correct the AI. We have to make the AI better. And how much better? Well, the local arbors and cortex are about 10 times larger than those of retinal neurons. So a starburst amicron cell, um, its total length of dendrites might be about three to five millimeters. And that's the total length of dendrites for a cortical neuron, a pyramidal neuron. But the local axon of a cortical neuron is 10 times longer than that of its dendrites. And so that means we uh, have to become 10 times faster in order to make progress in the cortex. That's a minimum. 10 times faster, which means the AI has to be 10 times more accurate. And ideally, we would reconstruct not just a few neurons, but reconstruct all of a cubic millimeter of cortex, which would mean a thousand times, we need to become a thousand times faster than this volume. So that's what's been done so far, um, and that's what actually has to be achieved, a thousand times speed up. And so we have to improve the scale and quality of images, uh, the algorithms, obviously, and the crowdsourcing. On all, on all cylinders, we have to be firing in order to achieve that kind of uh, speed up. Uh, and I think it's, it's critical here that we have to have both crowd and machine intelligence, because of course, to have machine learning, you've got to generate training data. So for Imperfect machines, we have to have people to actually get scientific results. 
and we can feed back the crowd input to machines to make the machines smarter. Now, what about Connectomics 3.0? That's even farther out, but uh, it's going to happen. So on the left, you can see um, something that looks kind of like a refrigerator, but it's not. It's a very expensive refrigerator. Uh, it's, it's Zeiss's multi-beam scanning electron microscope. Um, it's got 61 beams scanning in parallel. It's projected to produce a gigavoxel per second, um, enough to image a cubic millimeter every few weeks. Uh, Jeff Lickman has taken delivery of one at Harvard. Uh, Winfred's about to get the 91 beam instrument uh, later this year. Um, and people are working, you can see right here, uh, Sean McCullough is working on ways to s prepare a whole mouse brain for uh, imaging. So that's challenging. You know, you've you got a big, not just a small, uh, small sl thin slice of tissue, but you've got an entire brain that you have to um, fix and stain, get even quality all throughout it, uh, but they're working very hard on this problem. So Connectomics 3.0 would be the acquisition of, um, um, you know, something like, so 2.0, okay, this is, this is say 0.1 to 1 petabyte of image data for one cubic millimeter. And so Connectomics 3.0, we're talking about 0.1 to 1 exabyte of data from an entire mouse brain. Uh, and so that's going to happen. Uh, and at the same time, the two photon imaging people are working on imaging larger and larger fields of view. So cranial windows that are, say, 4 by 4 millimeters, that's happening in various places, including Princeton. So they want to be able to get the activity of many neurons across many cortical areas at the same time. And combined with whole brain anatomy, um, that's, that's what we're going for. And that will open the way towards um, whole brain emulation, which you guys, I think, are, are going to have to take over then. All right. So um, I'd like to thank my collaborators. I've collaborated with a lot of people in my lab, but also uh, many of these uh, outstanding uh, scientists um, at uh, various places around the world. Um, I've learned a lot from them, and uh, thank you for your attention. So I love the way you march through retina. I think it's fantastic work. Um, but as you pointed out, it relies a lot on the, the mosaic assumption. Um, what are you going to do in, in Cortex when you don't have that? Or do you think there's a chance that it's there and nobody's noticed? Or so how do you think about that issue? Well, so this is the big question. How much will the lessons of the retina generalize to the Cortex? Uh, you know, if you read Valentina Breitenberg, his opinion was the Cortex was highly random. So you look at the Cortex, it's a mess. It doesn't look like the beautiful retina. Um, it's just this hodgepodge. Breitenberg didn't really care enough about, he didn't really even like the layers at all. He said it's just one big randomly connected associative memory. Um, so that's one possible extreme. Uh, the other is that there could be a lot more structure than, than people expect. You know, maybe the mosaic property does hold in the cortex. Ha having written a book about how the brain is a mess, I still like the latter version that you offered. Um, <laughs> I, I think that there is structure there. The question is really how are we going to find that structure if it's not um, of the same kind of straightforward nature as, as the mosaic. Well, it may become straightforward if we had the data. If we had the right, right If we clues. had the data. So yeah. the, the, the problem right now is that, uh, or in the past, is that our data has always been fragmentary and, uh, of, uh, and imprecise. I'll yield the mic in one second, but what's your take on why the, the, the six-layered nature of the cortex itself hasn't given more clues than it has? I mean, so we know a lot about each of these six layers, but it's hard to find you know, a real clear idea of what they're doing. Or... Well, there's two reasons. So historically, physiologists didn't know what layer they were recording in. And the second reason, I think, is that the layers are too coarse. Uh, they're too coarse. You really need to have cell type specificity. So there's evidence emerging now that, that, that multiple cell types in the same layer may have very different response properties. Troy Marjorie has a nice paper on that. And that's certainly what we would expect from the retina. If we tried to say, you know, that's like saying, oh, all amicron cells are the same or all ganglion cells are the same. It's just, it's just ridiculously coarse. Thanks. So I, I think it's amazing that you're going for cortex now, thinking about it. But how long? Amazing or foolhardy? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, e e either of them. But how, how long? How long do you think it's going to be uh, until you'll be able to actually track the axons from one cortical area to the other cortical areas, or even subcortical structures that are far away? Well, local circuits. There's two issues: so local circuits and long-range connections. But long-range connections may actually be easier because uh, many cortical axons are myelinated, so they're thick, and they don't branch that much. So I would say the long-range connections, if the, people, if the imaging people can provide the data, lo the long-range connections might be much easier than the neuropill itself. 
but the data is not there. Okay, but so, so you, 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 just give me a year number maybe. And, until you're, you're tracking, say, from some brain area where you're doing connect homes to the various other areas it's connected to. Well, I thought this is what you're going to do. <laughs> so you tell me. <laughs> Hi, very nice talk. There, there's a bunch of things I would love to talk with you about offline, but something that struck me on one of your slides uh, you are categorizing the cells uh, beyond just the mosaic property. You're categorizing the cells physiologically, morphologically, and molecularly. Uh, you may stick this under molecular, but what about uh, um, I'm trying to think of the right word here? Um, cell fate, uh, its developmental state, its uh, configuration, its uh, regulatory genetic state. I think that's that's uh, that's a great way to do it. So the lineage would be great. And um, it's kind of included in molecular. So the idea is that many of the molecular differences in cells may somehow reflect uh, the different lineages. Uh, but you're right, lineage itself is a different source of information. So, so let me extend this question to more or less your last slide. You're talking about collecting exabytes of data, but effectively you're looking at the end result of a process, whereas you might have a much more parsimonious description of the system if you had a generative, uh, if you could go from a generative angle, which might be found through studying uh, the developmental processes and the genetic structure that's there. Well, I'm not against development. So what, what I would say in the retina is that, is that when we find structure in the adult retina, the next question is how does that develop? Right? So uh, in some sense, uh, neuroanatomy, static neuroanatomy sets up questions for physiology, right? So, uh, you know, let's say we see this. One question is, wh what physiological function does, does that serve in producing visual responses? The other is, how is this established in the course of development? Okay. And so, so that, that interplay is happening. I just didn't talk about that. Right. Didn't talk well, about the, that. the fundamental point here is if we want to solve the brain and you find that some uh, axis of your problem is growing extraordinarily large, maybe that suggests that we need to come at it from another angle. Um, well, all, all I can say, certainly there's many different ways to study the brain, and all I can say is that we just, everyone takes a different one and we see whether the results, you know, who gets the results first. So for example, in the case of space-time wiring specificity, I'm not going to say, that right. I'm not going to say this wiring diagram couldn't have been discovered some other way. Indeed, uh, those who are working, you could use optogenetics. If you had genetic control of these, over these cell types, you, you could use optogenetics and other, other ways to find it. It just so happens that genetic control over these cell types doesn't exist yet. So we happen to get there first. So there's, there's more than one way to skin the cat, and, uh, and it's just a technology, you know, it's a technology question. You know, maybe slice the, slice the cat. More than one way to slice the brain, or skin the brain, I don't know, okay. So I, I, I don't want to make claims about this is the only way to do it. This is one way to do it. I just want to push you a little bit on the hard problem uh, about, you know, translating the, the retinal work into the cortex. And, you know, one perspective on that is to look at what we know from electrophysiological recordings of various cortical areas. And what you see typically is just very distributed representations, coarsely tuned neurons, uh, and, and a lot of plasticity, right? So in that context, you know, what kind of specific ideas do you actually have about this, you know, how, how do you take and label a cell when, when the cells are plastic and furthermore, uh, there's just a lot of distributed representation in the sense that there's a lot of redundancy, there's a lot of uh, broad tuning curves, and so you may not have that kind of, you know, really precise specificity that you're going to have in the retina. So, uh, you know, what, how are you going to address those kind of questions? Well, there, there's there's two things. I mean, I think that the retina is, the example of the retina is helpful for understanding the, the innate architecture of the cortex, right? So it seems unlikely to me that the innate architecture of the cortex is less well-developed than that of the retina. If anything, it's more complicated. Right, but the mapping right? onto function, from what we already know, is got to be looser because, you know, the actual receptive fields are much, much more complicated. Yes, and but it, much seems, more it seems unlikely to me that you're, we're going to succeed in the cortex without figuring this out also. So that's the first statement I'm going to make. And the second is that if we want to understand the effects of learning, 
then there's no, there's no choice. We can't depend on the crutch of cell types. We have to combine activity and conductivity measurements in the same brain, right? And uh, here's an example then of, you know, if we ask, is there a local sequential conductivity that supports sequential activity? That would be a form of, of specificity and conductivity that doesn't have anything to do with cell types. It just has to do with functionally defined properties like time of activation. Right, and, we, and yet again, we already know that, that that's likely to be long range given, you know, if you lesion prefrontal cortex, that kind of memory capability, you know, goes away. Oh, I would say it's uh, unlikely, to be, it's, it's likely to contain both contributions. It's either or is unlikely. Either or yeah, is right. unlikely. Yeah, uh, right, yeah, okay, that's right.